and the tears to refresh us. And joy seems sweeter when cares come after, and a moan is the finest of foils of laughter, and that is life. Welcome to the Paul Lawrence Dunbar State Memorial. Paul Lawrence Dunbar was a gift to his people, born in 1872, who came through so much um, difficulty and managed to rise to such great heights and be an inspiration to all Americans. He was a writer. Uh, he wrote uh, every form of the language and wrote it well. He was a speaker. He was the first person in his family born in freedom. Both of his parents were ex-slaves. So he became a voice for his people. He did so by writing about human dignity. He actually wrote most of his work focused on the dignity of all people, and in particularly, the humanity of the black man in America. Dayton has always been important to Paul, and Paul has always been an, uh, a, a beautiful adjunct to the possibilities in Dayton, because Paul lived in eight locations before he purchased this home for his mother. He managed to travel, and he was like a sponge. He pulled in ideas. He never went to college because he started writing and expressing his ideas, and he learned very early in life to absorb from his environment, to absorb from his contacts, to learn and to grow. We are standing in the Paul Lawrence Dunbar Loafing Holt. Loafing Holt is a term that Dunbar learned while he was in England. And when he returned from England, he situated his study in a similar fashion that he created for himself his own Loafing Holt. What is a Loafing Holt? It's a place to loaf. This is where he would sit in his Morris chair and recline and rest his eyes, sometimes putting a blanket over him. Dunbar enjoyed his day bed. He always kept a cover on it, and he would cover himself. He could lay here and look out at the world passing beneath him. He enjoyed his desk. It was at his desk that he kept all important references, although his treasure was this particular bookcase. Dunbar kept his books here, although he had so many books around his walls. And he had collected all of the contemporary African-American writers of his times. And he had a collection of the classics that would rival any library collection. He kept pictures of his friends because friends uh, were, all of his friends were new to pictures. Photography was a, a new and a recent attainment. And he enjoyed exchanging pictures and getting pictures. Dunbar wrote many books and he wrote them by compiling his thoughts collectively from time to time. And many of his books, are outstanding, but the two rarest books of his are Oak and Ivy and Majors and Minors. Now, it's something interesting. Oak and Ivy was his first publication. It captured the musical tone and the rhythm of black expression at the time. And remember, he was capturing a people who had been captured and not allowed to speak a native language, but who had to adjust to a new language. And as they adapted it, it became known as dialect. And it is beautiful. And Dunbar recognized the beauty. And the world did not get it. So he said, well, OK. My second book, and this is a first edition, Majors and Minors. 
This book includes dialectical passages as well as passages in standard English. Those first two books of Dunbar are his rarest because only 500 copies of Oak and Ivy were ever circulated. And I don't know how many, there were reprints of majors and minors, but increasingly they too are very difficult to find. We're now walking into Paul's bedroom. Paul's Remington typewriter was probably his most valued literary tool. It was on this little machine that he typed all of his correspondences and works yet to be published. He spent many, many hours, day and night. He worked unceasingly. He developed that pattern and he would be back and forth through the night from his loafing hole to his bedroom, from his loafing hole to his bedroom without interfering with his mother's rest. She had the other end of the hall for her movement through the night. But his Remington typewriter was the pride and joy of his life. We're standing in the family parlor. Dunbar's books were so expressive of the times, his level of development, and his imagination. He wrote The Uncalled about a white character. Black people could not read when he first started writing his novels. And as a result, he knew he was writing primarily to a white audience. So he developed a plot so that this young man just encountered more and more difficulty trying to uh, it spread the word of the gospel to the point that he walks away in failure and decides to move on to Cincinnati. That particular novel was not very highly rated by the critics, but his best novel was his Sport of the Gods. The English publication was entitled The Jest of Fate, and it's the story of a black family having difficulty and then fleeing the difficulty in the South, they move north. And then they're caught into the jaws of ghetto living and being persons with their Southern standards really fall victim to the many surprises of life in New York. Dunbar had a message with the simplicity and the beauty and the values that the black family had known were so basic, and particularly in the South. And unless you have seen uh, the struggle of the North in the black ghetto, you don't, you're not even aware of those kind of entrapments being in the world today. And Dunbar learned of those entrapments and he wrote about them. Paul contracted tuberculosis. He died at age 33. And the interesting thing about his death, he would recite the 23rd Psalm in his mother's arms downstairs on that day bed. He got to the line, yea though, I walked through the valley and shadow of his eyes closed on the word death. And that is how he died.